Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. No. Um. <laughs>
that fifty dollars, you know, I still think about this guy all the time. It just it was a miracle, absolute miracle. So when I walked out of, I I stretched that fifty dollars out for a long, long time. <laughs> Coffee, you know, tuna fish, where the cheapest things I could find. Uh, I never did. I just kept moving around. I didn't have a home, and when you when you're homeless, you're you're in a different set of mind. You are fighting to survive day by day. And I kind of forgot about the guy, but once I made it, I thought about him and his company, and I just I was just blessed. That was the real blessing. I realized that day I was that close to being completely homeless with no family support, no one. But you know, when I left St. Louis, I said I'm never coming back. So it's and I said I'm going to live or die in L.A. That's what I said. I was determined not to go back. And you made it. Yes, but really, it was tough. At the <laughs> Close call. You know, Muscle Beach is still a destination spot for people that love bodybuilding and want to go visit. Uh, you live in Las Vegas now. Is it different going back now and seeing what Muscle Beach has become as a spectacle versus what it was in its heyday? Yeah, you know, back in those days, you had people from all over the world flocking to Venice you know, to see the bodybuilders on, you know, working out in the weight pen, Arnold, of course, and a lot of great names trained there. And, and that's, you know, what George Turner, my trainer back in St. Louis, he said, go to Venice, California, you know, and look up Ken Waller. But I made my way to the beach first and I started working out and it was just a bunch of guys out there, you know, just in the hot heat, squatting with the music blasting. It was a big party. It was, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed training out there. It was really hot, you know, 110 degrees doing squats. <laughs> Who cared? Uh, and it was cheap, you know, $3 a week. So I could afford that. And um, now it's, I go down. I still have great memories of it, but I just sit back. I can watch the show, the show, three shows a year they have down there still, and a lot of competitors. Uh, just the, the vibe has changed. Because then it was just more about, it wasn't social media, you had nothing. So if you didn't have a magazine to read about the guys. So we didn't know what was happening in the world. And everybody went to Venice to become a bodybuilder. I mean, if you wanted publicity or be with the readers' office uh, in the magazines, you had to be in Venice, California. And uh, I was, that was my mission. I told my trainer, I'm moving to California. And he just lost it. <laughs> You're going to do what? Yes. And uh, I wanted to be a professional bodybuilder. And you succeeded at it. Yes, but you should, you never know because, you know, you have this dream and you're going to follow that dream, but still, that doesn't mean you're going to make it. My only up, upside to this was that if I work hard enough, I might make it. And that's, that, was, that stayed in my head the whole time. And then I realized uh, genetically, I thought structurally I had a decent body. I was a tiny guy. I got small bones, small joints, small waist. So I've never big. But as if I can put enough muscle size on and get, you know, my diet, get perfect diet, uh, learn how to pose. There's so many things goes into this. And mentally, you got to stay strong because you had a lot of negativity coming, you know, coming for you at, at the same time. But you just ignore it. You ignore it and follow your dream. Just continue to follow it. You know, watching old videos from your era and Charles Glass and, <clears throat> you know, Ferrigno and Schwarzenegger and everybody else from that time period, Frank Zane, obviously, and, and Franco Colombo, there was a technique that, well, not tech, excuse me, showmanship that seems to be missing in today's bodybuilding. You know, you guys made it elegant you guys made the movements matter as you transitioned from pose to pose it wasn't just show us your side pose show us your back show us your quads all right thank you next you know at what point does that get lost in bodybuilding from you know this elegant movement that's almost a dance which is actually mentioned in the documentary to all right let's get as big as we possibly can and I'm not blaming Dorian Yates because Dorian Yates is, I think, the original mass monster. But to the point of let's get as huge and not as aesthetic as we should be to the point that they've created a classic physique. 
in in professional bodybuilding? Right. For me, I never wanted to be big. I just wanted aesthetics, conditioning, and presentation. I mean, that's that's why I got into bodybuilding because I saw this guy back in St. Louis posing on stage. It was, it was just amazing to watch. And I saw the art. I said, he's an artist. Look at his, and his body is the art. So it's choreographed to music. You're transitioning from pose to pose. I mean, each individual had, you put on a show. I mean, Kai Green is putting puts on the show. You don't know what he's going to do next. And that's the idea of posing. You go under the bright lights and you go from pose to pose to pose. I used to get standing ovation on course all the time. I couldn't figure out why. But, you know, I think they like my movement, my posing. And I realized I'm not a big guy. So if I'm, if I'm going to beat one of the big guys, then I need to be the best poser on stage. I got to draw some attention. Frank Zane was very good at, at two, drawing attention to himself. He wasn't a big guy. He would drop down to the kneeling pose and the twisting with the hands and all these things. And you pay attention to that. It draws you in. So it's like watching, it's, it's, it's a play without lyrics, without words. You know, I'm trying not to give too much away, especially with your upbringing and the roughness that, that that was a part of, that you still have a positive disposition after all that and dealing with your great aunt and the neglect of your biological father and you know reconnecting with your mother because he took you away from her and everything else, that you still have this positive disposition is, is uh, quite incredible. Uh, would that be part of your Christian upbringing and having gone to church on a continuous basis from childhood on? Yes, absolutely. Because you went to church every Sunday <laughs> and that was just a part of your life. You know, from the deep South and in those days, that was like number one, church, church. And when I got to LA, I would pray every day, you know, I didn't have any money, I'd a tiny little apartment and I just pray to God that I'm going to make it. There was there was no worse, no no one else to turn to, you know. I couldn't didn't have my mom at the time, and my dad, you know, he passed away, and so I'm living in L.A. by myself, just completely alone. And uh, but I think prayer, you know, even today, gets me through. Because when times when I'm down and out, I go, God will take it. He'll take care of it. He'll fix it. Don't worry about it. You know, in the documentary, you mentioned, and I'm going to paraphrase your mom because I can't direct quote it from memory, uh, that she told you you were by yourself your entire life and that this is nothing new to you. Have you been able to find someone to add to your life after having been so alone? Or is that loneliness become such a custom in one's life that adding someone to it could throw off the balance and the drive? That's a good question. <laughs> um, no, I haven't found someone. Uh, it's it's tough because bodybuilding, you put everything you have into it. You be, you, you live it. You're it. You know, and to find someone to uh, to uh, to appreciate that or support you, it, it, I mean, you sacrifice a lot. You, you sacrifice everything. I mean, if you really want to be the best of the best, and not just to get there, but to stay there. So for twenty years, I tried to stay there. And that just took, it took me all over the world. I sell the world and it's, it's, it's a tough life. It sounds glamorous when you're on stage posing, but those are just moments. And what happens when you're off stage and what happens when you lose, when you happen to the critics, you got to shut it out, keep moving forward. Well, every time I lost a show, I never went back to try to win that show. I moved forward to the next show. So yeah, prayer, you know, everybody needs that. That's that's what's been keeping me going all these 50 years. It, what's interesting is, is that at 20 years old, you know, at 18 years old, you decide that in two years, you're going to become Mr. America. And you dedicated two years to it, and you became Mr. America. And then 40 years later, you get asked, hey, do you want to compete? And you're like, sure, give me a year. And you do it again. Like, what is that in you 40 years later to sit there and to go from, you know what, I'm retired, I just exercise for myself to keep my health, you know, Zane's in his 70s, he does that, he just exercises for his own health benefits, no, I'm going to get up on stage in a natural bodybuilding competition and go full force. Yeah, I went to the show here in town and uh, Doug Brignoli won the show, you know, Doug, and I'm sitting there going, hmm. <laughs> 
You know, I, I think I can beat him is what I said to myself. So I go home and I get this, this text message. You want to compete next year? Yes. It was just right away. I just knew I'm going to give it a shot. It's in town. I don't have to travel. The last time I was on stage in Las Vegas, 1982. Um, in fact, I had the plenty of pairs. So 1982 was the last time on stage in the state of Nevada. And I said, well, I want people to see me on stage. to see the magazines. It's different when you see somebody live. So, um, yeah, I, I agreed to it. And, and, I, and I said, but then the pandemic hit to 2020. But I made a decision in November that I'm going to compete and nothing was going to stop me. So we had no gyms early on 2020. And I went to the park, lunges, uh, pull-ups, dips, whatever I could do. Gyms reopened. I was back on my schedule and made it to November. And it was drug tested. It was drug free. And uh, by the grace of God, I won. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you this that I ask every other bodybuilder or fitness uh, expert out there. You're allowed to only do total body exercise three times a week for the rest of your life. What one exercise per body part do you choose? Of course, squats. <laughs> uh, dumbbell presses. Is that for chest or shoulders? Shoulders. Oh, no, b both. Yeah. Um, Bobby Rose or deadlifts. I would say deadlifts. Compound movements. Um, of course, work the abs, rope crunches, the hanging leg raises. Bicep, preacher curl. Triceps. Dips off the bench. I really like those. It hits all three hits really quick. So I'm just trying to find one exercise going to hit a lot of things very quickly and compound movements would do that. You know, it's the hardcore stuff that, that develops your body, not this things I see lately. But I, I'm, I'm an old school basic. So, you know, I trained with Robbie Robinson and Kent Keen and all these champs in L.A., and it was hardcore. <laughs> you keep up or there's a door. So Well, you I kept still, up and you surpassed them. <laughs> Well, you know, no, they're still the great. I have nothing but respect. They taught me so much. You know, I I was a sponge, man. I got to L.A. You tell me once, I got it. <laughs> and, you know, good form, you know. You know, your body reflects how you look from training. I can look at a person's body and know how he's training uh, because of the shape, the definition, um, the, the conditioning of the body. It just It just tells you a lot. I mean, I have a lot. I, I, I sit back and watch. I see a lot of things. Man, that guy trains really hard. Like sometimes at the gym, I go say, man, that's really good stuff. So, you know, I, I encourage a lot of people because I could see them working really hard and they want it really bad. You can see it. When I was training back in the day, you know, guys, people from all over the world would come to Gold Gym in Santa Monica and they said, man, we, we, we saw you across the room training and your face said, don't come near me. So it's, it's very intense. Very intense. But, you know, we trained with Robert Robinson, legendary. You know, there was no word spoken. <laughs> For an hour and 15 minutes, it's just all out. In perfect form. So he really believed in form and technique. That's how I survived for so long, is, is using good form. We train heavy, but he always explained to me, it's, it's heavy, moderate, and light. It's never always heavy. So you got to mix the three. And this is why you get the detail and separation, all the lines. You have cuts on top of cuts because you're hitting it from different angles. So it's a science behind it. And do you guys definitely develop that science in your era? Uh, you know, the documentary briefly mentions the WBF, the World Bodybuilding Federation, that uh, Vince McMahon had put together, who bought the World Wrestling Federation from his father for a million dollars and now sold it for, I think, what was it, $9.1 billion or, or some astronomical amount uh, to Endeavor. When What was it like working for Vince McMahon in, what was this, 89, 90 at the time? Yeah, 91, 92. Okay, so 91, 92. Um, the steroid scandal hit, so we knew who dropped out quick because they might have been on some stuff. Uh, allegedly, we don't know specifically. And 
you know, going through a show like that in comparison to the Olympia or Mr. Universe or Mr. America, where it was far more focused on showmanship than just the aesthetic. Yes, it was. And uh, Tom Platz, he found me somewhere in Europe because <laughs> I just kind of disappeared at times. And he said, you know, we're Vince starting a new federation and we need performance. We need artistic people and, you know, know how to pose and work the stage charisma. And he goes, you are one of the guys we we're looking for. And I said, OK, I'm in. <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was fun. You know, it was a competition, but also it was, it was a show as well. Um, and we all had character names. You know, I was a jet man. So, so uh, you know, it was, it was really taking off. It was really getting big. We had a uh, magazine out every week, and we had, um, uh, you just name it. We had, the fans knew who we were. We were hanging out with the wrestlers all the time backstage. It was a lot of fun. It was a couple of, couple of good years. Do you think that the WBF could have a resurgence at this point now and give the IBEF pros a, a run for their money where the showmanship aspect of bodybuilding could return? I would say yes, but so, the showmanship would have to return because, you know, you got to perform. I mean, that was really part of Vince's thing, performing. If you're not up to par performing, you're out. So, you know, I, I come on and do my routine and you choreograph your routine and the music to go with it. You got to create your own music. So it is a show. He's like, he wants, it's showtime. Yeah, he wants you to be in conditioning, of course. And for your own sake, I never walk on stage unless I'm 100% in shape, either guest posing or competing. Because that's what people, they're going to remember that. Oh, he was out of shape. You're not going to hear that. So, yeah, you know, I take pride in it because, you know, I used to do a lot of guest posing and and I tell the promoters, don't worry, I'll be in shape. And they knew it. And then the word, the word got out, so... It just, you know, it's, it's work. It's part, it's your job. It's your job. And I said, I'm not going to let the competitors look better than me. So I'll, that was my training inspiration. You know, professional bodybuilder, guest poser, you have a documentary, you're an author. Um, when you look at modern bodybuilding and you see the turns that it's made away from what your era did, is there a way to pivot back or are we just too far gone in the direction that we've gone, we've come because, you know, we do want to see the mass monsters and these guys that are just enormous and, you know, they're your height. They're about five, eight, but instead of one ninety two ten, some of these guys are three fifty walking around. And I'm just like, my God, like, how do you find pants? Right. I mean, I had issues finding pants because that's super small ways, but the legs, you know what I mean? So there was always a, in the jackets. Oh, yeah, I had problems weighing, you know, 198 pounds, 200 pounds. Uh, um, you can't turn this. That's what they want. You know, social media, you know, bigger, the better and, and, the, and the definition. And oh you know, no, you can't turn back. I mean, the class of physique, the aesthetic class of physique class, I think that could work. I think that could work. But I would like to be helping those guys work on their posing. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? So, so it, like I said, it's a performance, a show, and you got to hit your best pose and hide your flaws. Mm -hmm. So I try to be creative. I got a couple of signature poses that I kind of created. You know, I stole a little bit from Frank Zane, a little bit from Ryder, a little bit from Arnold. You, know, you and you kind of mold into your to your to who you are. I do want to ask you: How did you create that vacuum? of the way you were able to pull in your abdominals almost all the way up into your rib cage from the way it looked in some of the videos. You know, what is a training exercise for the vacuum that, that people could work on if they want to try that, that look at least whether classic physique or, uh, you know, physique where they run around in the board shorts now? Yeah. Very good question to do the vacuum pose. I see a lot of guys now they pull it in, but they're not pulling it up. So, you know, Frank Zane, the master pulling it up. So I, I kind of parroted myself after him. Um, I personally, it just happened out of nowhere. I, I'm sure that's in the book somewhere. And I was working and all of a sudden I lost my stomach. I go, what happened to it? And I reached down and my stomach was my throat, basically. <laughs> it just happened. 
And then I, of course, I used it from that day from that day forward. But to practice it, you got to pull from the lower abdominal, lean over on the table or counter, and try to pull in from the very bottom. And then once you start pulling it in, you're going to feel like two cords in your throat because you're pulling it all the way up up to your throat, basically pulling. And then you know, because you know you're not breathing at this point, you're not getting any air. So it's a tough shot to hit. Hit the vacuum and then flex every muscle at the same time and smile. It's it, tough. it looks intense. It's very intense. But you know, I I can hit it. I have was hitting it from four or five different angles: uh, side pose, front, crucifix. You know, any corner you hit it. Um, but then again, you got to take a break. You turn turn around, do a back pose, catch your breath, and come back to the front. <laughs> There's a lot of other things going on. So by accident, but if you really want to learn this, you do it on a full stomach. If you can do a vacuum with a full stomach, you're good on stage because you have nothing. You're, you're, you're empty. You're dry. So I would practice with a full stomach. Uh, and just you know, There's a lot of time in the mirror. I see a lot of people lying now, girls and guys, really hitting a good vacuum pose. I go, yeah. Then I see some guys on stage, ah, a little bit more, pull, 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 <laughs> pull it in more. I think it's impressive because... It's just so different, you know, if you can hit a back with a zane type of pose or that crucifix pose. Um, it's just a different type of pose. You know, a lot of bodybuilders from your, I, I mentioned Charles Glass earlier, he's created his own YouTube page and, you know, calls himself the godfather of bodybuilding and, and has developed quite a nice reputation for himself with some tremendous workouts that, that he's put online. Have you thought of going that route yourself and making your own YouTube channel and following that path of, you know, internet guru for the next generation of bodybuilders. I have a, a, a channel. I do have a channel, but it's just basic uh, for me, basic plain exercises, you know, from back in the day in old school and stick to basics. So I have quite a few followers. But I don't think I'm going to go into because it's a lot of work. You got to post a lot. <laughs> and I want to post when I want to post. So, I mean, I know Charles Glass really well. You know, we competed against each other head to head in the beginning, many shows. So I know Charles really well. So, um, I mean, it's a great idea. But like I said, I just want to post some things. But what I have on there is, I think, proper form and technique, you know, basic exercises, compound exercises, you know. Um, it, it, it just, I don't know, just basic stuff. It's nothing over the top. And with your level of expertise, I do need to ask you this. What is your take on resistance bands as part of training? Personally, I've never used a resistance band, but I believe they do work. I mean, I see girls and guys using the bands all the time. They get results. So whatever works for you, that's what you stick with. I mean... I got, I'm just basic T-ball rows, <laughs> pull up, dips, one arm dumbbell rows, CD cable rows, and squats, basically. And, and of course, working the biceps, concentration curls, preacher curls. So as you can see, it's really basic stuff. And I hear that about my channel all the time. Oh, just basic movements. But basic movement got to where I'm at. So, and I'm still, I'm still going. You know, in 2020, I, I had a pinched nerve in my neck. Uh, I couldn't get in shape. I quit twice. I said, I can't do it. The fat's not coming off. I'm 63 years old. My mom's telling me, pack it in. You just need to stop. <laughs> Nothing's going to stop me. You know what I said? I looked in the mirror and I go, you never stopped before. You're not going to quit now. And that kept me going. Yeah. So you didn't necessarily quit. You just took two breaks. I took two breaks. <laughs> but I stayed on the wagon. Yes. Yes. I yeah. got to get there. When you finally finish that competition in Las Vegas at 63 years old and you step off the stage, is the mentality of, I'm not going to do this again? Is it, this was the, the best way to end a beautiful career? Or is it, all right, I was born in Memphis. Let me go find a rib place and chow down. It was, yes. Um, <laughs> let's go find the rib place and chow down. Now, when I walked up that stage, I go, okay, I can't do this again because my body still not the same. It, it, it took too much out of me. Now, for 17 weeks, I trained twice a day, never missed a day. 
Because I said, I'm going to go on that stage at 63. There won't be one ounce of fat anywhere. And I'm going to work on my posing. I'm going to do everything I need to do. So if I lose, I can say that I did all I could do. Don't cheat. Don't don't have breaks. Uh, it's a mental thing. I didn't have any support. I didn't have a support team around me. Uh, you know, I did it all by myself. You know, I did my own diet, which basically starving. <laughs> and you train twice a day for 17 weeks. And I remember some of those workouts that just didn't have anything left. But then I said, my competitors are coming to get me. It's time to go to the gym. So, you know, you got to just say a few things to motivate yourself. I don't need a motivational speaker. I speak to myself. And I always have. You need to become somebody else's motivational speaker at this point and go on tour with that. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody has, you got a desire. In, like, If you have a dream, you just got to follow it. And that sometimes is involved with a lot of work, a lot of discipline, sacrifice. Your body hurts. Like I had a pinched nerve. I couldn't even lift my arm to pose. I was in shape for the, for the contest, but right at the end, a guy worked on me a little bit to relieve the stress and the, the, the nerve in my neck, and I was able to hit the poses. So for, for my hopes, I just continued to train. <laughs> hoping by the showtime it'll be okay. But you're not gonna let that stop you. My knee was hurting, this is hurting. It's the age factor too, as we get older. But I just wanted, it was at home. I said, I need to do this. And you know, Doug Brignola was a great guy, very supportive, great man. You know, we miss him. But I went to that show. So things happen for a reason. I went to the show just to watch a show. Then I get there and go, hmm. This looks really good. So uh, that's what happens. Things just happens. You, you, your life is not planned. It, it is planned for you. You're not planning your life. And I realized that later on in life. Everything that's happened to me, it happened for a reason. I was in the right place at the right time. You know, Hollywood couldn't write this. <laughs> on and on and on. I mean, what are, what are the chances of being in Muscle Beach on that particular day and then Arnold comes over to you? And I mean, what are the chances? So it's, it's timing, it's timing and believing. And you definitely believed and you made it happen. And I'm thrilled that I get a chance to, to speak with somebody that, that lived their dream. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, for all those young people out there that have the desire and a dream to just follow your dream, you know, believe in yourself. The most of thing, believe in yourself because if you don't, no one else will. And you're going to have a lot of people around and say, oh, you can't do it. They say that because they can't do it. You can't. So it's a mindset. It's a mindset with training, nutrition. You know, I can't do the diet. Yes, you can. If you really want it bad enough, you'll do the diet. You train hard enough, diet, cardio, all these things are working together. Never once I said, oh, I don't want to work out today. I couldn't wait to get to the gym. You know, back in those days. Oh, Santa Monica goes gym. I mean, the atmosphere and the energy in that place. You had others across the room looking at you. You staring back at them. <laughs> Motivation. <laughs> you know, I I would be remiss not to ask this question. In the documentary, you said at some point to regain electrolytes, you were just chowing down straight out of a box of salt. Yes. Do you still have that box of salt as a reminder of like what you put yourself through just sitting on the shelf, the empty box? Yes, I do. Yeah. Because I was, yeah, I was cramping all over. So this is the last show, though. I had to, I had to use the salt quite a bit. Uh, yeah, that just goes to show I was, whatever it took, whatever I had to do, and without the drugs. So that's hard work. Comes back to you. You know, who can train 17 weeks twice a day? Don't miss a day. It's just hardcore. It's, it's the mind. It's the mind. People say, oh, the body controls the mind. No, the mind controls the body. Your mind tells you to get that last two reps. I can't. I'm in fire. I'm dying. Go ahead and die. Who cares? I push myself. I stop counting reps. I push. I can't move. I push and the muscles numb. Then I know it's a good set. So that's what you got. Every set is the same thing. It just, I had so many training partners. And I just we just go down together, you know. <laughs> So you know, it, it, you, if you, anything in life is hard, nothing is easy. Writing that book was really hard. So I just stepped out of my bodybuilding world into a writer's world. 
hardcore. And then I, you know, I did the um uh the uh what do you call it? I'll get it. See, that's the age kicking in. <laughs> the audiobook. That was hard to do an audiobook. It's it's it was unbelievable. I did it in my closet. Yes, in my closet. <laughs> it's got it the right acoustics. Forever. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but that's determined. I just wanted to do it, and nothing's going to stop me from doing it. I don't care how long it takes. I learned that from bodybuilding. You have to be patient because you train a whole year for one show. And if you lose, what do you do now? You go back to the drawer. You wait another year. So, <laughs> a lot of patience. People go, oh, I want to grow a lot of muscle in six months. And so, it might take you three, four, five years to get quality muscle, muscle you will never lose. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's a fun sport. You enjoy it. You enjoy, I, enjoy, I love going on stage. That was the only time I felt comfortable was under the stage lights. So I was, you know, shy. So I would, I would go hide after the show. But uh, in posing, this guy named Jimmy Caruso, I don't know if you've heard of him, he taught me, gave me a three hour lesson once and up in Toronto, Canada. He taught me all the Zane moves, the knees, the hips, this, 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 the hands, the fingertips, the expression. So three hours working with him. And then Kent Keen helped me a lot with the posing. Because I was the worst poser ever. George Turner made that clear. Uh, is in the book, you know. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to master posing. My only chance to win is to outpose my competitor because they're bigger, you know, taller. But if I can outwork him, and that's when, you know, pose and count it, that you get scored. There's a score for that. You might win by one point. That's all you need. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, it was a, it's a, it's been a great ride. I look back and go, really? Now I look back and go, did I really do that? <laughs> What I got so many pictures I see, and I go, Why did I take that? I can't, so many, I swear, so many pictures I see a magazine online. I go, Why did I take that? I can't remember doing that. <laughs> but you know, for 20, 30, 40 years of doing it, you know, you did a lot of stuff. I don't remember all of it. What does retirement post your final show look like? Obviously, you're promoting the book, you're promoting the documentary. But the intensity of the workouts obviously aren't twice a day, hour and a half a day for 17 weeks. You know, what does that look like? And a lot of bodybuilders, before you answer that, have that fear of getting smaller because they spent so much time getting bigger. And you don't have the size right now that you did in your, in your final competition. You know, is there a difficulty in allowing yourself to become leaner rather than, than bulkier? Yes, I for sure have lost some size. I don't tra I train once a day and sometimes like every three or four days I'll miss. But I'm training once a day and I'm just training for my health. <laughs> I just want to be healthy. You know, I don't need uh, weighing 200 pounds. I'm about 180, which is okay. I'm okay. I'm still proportionally balanced and it's uh, the cuts is fairly still there. The waist is still small. I can still do the vacuum. So that's not important anymore. It's just um, being healthy. It's working out. You know, I do cardio and I train and still eat fairly well, fairly clean. Uh, I've been hearing quite often, you're looking skinny. <laughs> but I've heard that my whole career from day one. All my competitors would tell me, you're skinny. And I said, but I'll see you on stage tomorrow. <laughs> so it's a mind game, of course. So I'm still hearing that same thing. You're skinny. So I'll go out skinny. <laughs> and what does it look like? I, you know, it's not about, I never wanted to be. You never wanted to be a mass I never, monster. No, I never did. I never wanted to be big. I said, just big enough to win. That's all. So I would go on stage. I would pose competing or guest posing. People run backstage, look at me and they go, was that you out there? Because I look small. I go, yeah, that was me. It's an illusion. Posing is an illusion. You create a master illusion. And the first time I saw Frank Zane live was in Orange County. Me and Robbie went to see him gas pose. 
and he was standing on stage waiting for his music to start. He was standing from the side. And I go, that was the Lincoln? You know, to myself, I was a kid, 20, 20, 20 years old. And then when he started to hit those poses, one after the next, he kept getting bigger, bigger, and more dramatic. It was, it was just, I was on the edge of my seat. And that really pulled me in once again. I mean, LA is, oh my God, this is, this is incredible. This guy's incredible. So yeah, and I, I, I learned a lot from that moment. Posing means a lot. Posing, and, and, and the judges expected you to pose, to be creative. Because when people pay a lot of money to go to a, to a competition like this, you're going to see a show. And well, in those days, it was a sh it was showtime. You had different music. You had to set your own music. You try to create your own new poses. You know, you copy people. But um, I mean, Arnold went to classes to learn how to pose, right? So that was really important. And for me, seeing Frank do posing that way was like unreal. Just unreal, mind blowing. And your mouth's like, really? Yeah. In the documentary, there you make mention. Well, the documentary makes mention that you had an re uncanny resemblance to Michael Jackson at the time, only a lot bigger. Did you ever get a chance to meet Michael and pose with him, just you know, for fun or just hanging out or whatever it was? I wish. So situation 95, 1995, 1996, I was training his dermatologist. And I would go to his house and train him. He had a full gym, of course. He was dermatologist to the stars. So I was training him and I saw pictures of Michael Jackson in his house. I go, who oh, was Michael Jackson? Pictures is a good friend of mine. And he come to visit quite often, he said. So I said, oh, okay. And uh, so one day I was training the doctor and he's on the light press machine and the phone rings and it was Michael. So he had me the phone. So here I am talking to Michael Jackson on the phone. So yeah, you know, it was a great little conversation, very brief, but I never met him in person. The doctor promised I would get to meet him. It never happened because he was on tour the whole time in Europe. Um, but yeah, they said, I look like Michael Jackson. You know, that came about, you read that part in the book, how it came about. Because I had my nose done around the, some of the cost of Michael too. That's part of it. And once I got the nose job and people go, God, resemblance here. So I just kind of Jerry curl and the Jerry curl. Oh yeah. I went all out. <laughs> I went down to the makeup too. <laughs> And at the hat, the whole thing. Oh, yeah. If I'm going to be Michael, I'm going to be Michael all the way. Once again, <laughs> performing. It's all this show. Uh, so, yeah, that was that was an interesting turn. Um, so I never got to meet him in person. I wish I had. I wish I could have. But uh, I spoke to him on the phone. That, that's an incredible story. Not too many people get a chance to talk to Michael Jackson even on the phone. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the voice got me like, oh, my God, I'm talking about this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in your documentary, Eric, the trainer makes quite a few appearances. And unfortunately, we lost Eric last year. Yes. Um, I had the chance to meet Eric twice on two, you know, obviously on two brief occasions. What was it like knowing Eric as a person outside from Eric, the persona? Because he seemed like a genuine guy in the brief ex exchanges that we had. But, you know, there's the Eric, the, and you know, Eric, the trainer, and then there's Eric himself when the cameras aren't rolling. What was it like knowing Eric? Eric was Eric all the time, on camera, off camera. Nicest guy you could ever meet. You know, it's just, it's such a loss. Um, he was always helpful to everyone. He listened, he gave advice, you know. He trained a lot of people in Hollywood. He would fly to Vegas to train with me. I mean, that was an honor. He said, I trained the stars, but I'm going to go train with Tony Pearson. And he would fly over there periodically, sometimes bring his whole crew. So we work out at the gym, and then we go, then I send him to my massage guy, and then we just hang out. He was such a nice guy. He was a guy I knew that I could call, and he would be there. So that's he was helpful to everybody. There was nothing fake about him. He was straightforward. 
And that's that was his personality. I always said, God, I wish I could be like him. <laughs> you know, yeah. So just just really shocking. Really shocking. That, yeah. you know, I've seen that train at his gym in North Hollywood a few times. In fact, you know, the document did a lot of filming. We did a lot of filming there. So yeah. No, there was nothing fake about him. He's really a good guy. He helped everybody. What would you, at this age, like to tell Tony, who had $9 in his pocket when he got to L.A. to expect in life? I don't know. And, you know, I, I, I went to L.A. and on a prayer. You know, like I said, I prayed every day. Am I going to survive? Am I going to really make this? Fear, you know, I had no fear leaving St. Louis. You know, I went with a friend you read about all this. So we got to LA and he and all of a sudden he he's not there anymore. And 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 when the moment I felt I was completely and isolated along in downtown Los Angeles, the fear came over me. It was unbelievable. Because no one knew me. They don't know who I was. And some kid, you know, he's saying St. Louis. So yeah, uh, I I some I had doubts. We all have doubts. Am I going to really survive this? You know, there's no one to call. There's no send me a ticket. I'm coming. No, and I said I'm not going back. So usually when I say something, that's it. I'm not I'm not going back. As a loser, no, I'm going to stay here. And just see, and then hope and pray. I mean, there was no guarantee I was going to win any title. I was going to go anywhere. A lot of people have dreams, but you have to try. You have to take that step forward, and you have to have have no fear. Fear keeps people away. So I didn't have any fear until, until that moment, but now it's too late. I'm already there. So I made my way from downtown St. Louis to Muscle Beach. And then I walked into Gold's Gym very quickly. I walked into Gold's Gym, the original Gold's Gym, Pacific Avenue, and it was a lucky day for me because I think all the guys were there. Zane, Joe Weider was taking pictures of Frank Zane that day, and Manuel Perry, Robinson, uh, Ken Waller, Manuel Perry, you name the list, Bill Grant, the list just goes on and on and on. And I just creeped over to the corner. I was sitting in the corner just watching these guys train. I mean, so intense. I think that's where I got the mindset, too, for watching them. It's not what they tell me, it's what I see. And the intensity was just incredible. It's insane. You don't get rest between sets. There's no water. There's no talking. You're training. So I think that I I took, took all that in. So when I had my training partner, it was the same thing. Like, talking about what? You can call me. Talk to me later. We're training. <laughs> so, yeah, um, that was an incredible moment to go to the original Gold's Gym and, and see all the pros that I had seen on television back in St. Louis. I saw Arnold, I saw Muhammad Mikawi, Danny Padilla, uh, Arnold, Arnold, of course, and Robbie. And then they're in front of me. Oh my God, <laughs> how could this be? But for one second, I was sitting there looking at those guys and I go, if I train hard enough, I think I could look like those guys. See what I mean? Because yeah, they had these massive arms and the chest and there was, Everybody's in top shape. It was all cut. But I something came over me and said, if you train hard enough, I think I can look like these guys. But that was far, far from getting there. You know, it was just what I weighed about 170 pounds, maybe. <laughs> so but once again, you gotta believe that you can do it. At least try. But you don't give up because when you give up, you just lost. So I just thought. I got. I lost a lot of shows. I lost a lot of shows, but I just kept moving forward and kept trying to get better. Because from show to show to show, you're kind of competing against yourself. Because the judges says, "Well, we've seen you better," so that realize you got to get. You know what I mean? You got to improve yourself. Figure out the weak body parts, bring them up, work on the posing, everything you need to do. So it's, you know, it, it takes, and it takes time and it takes years. People want quick results, all the titles and all the fame. No, all that takes time. Take time. It takes a lot of time.
Um, but it was fun. I love working out. I love being in California. I love Venice. I thought it was great. Santa Monica, great. I, can't, I remember once I went down to Santa Monica Pier and I says, I'm never leaving this place. A couple of years later, I'm gone. <laughs> Wherever I could make a living, I had to go. So I went to uh, Rhode Island. Yeah. Did a guest posing there in Rhode Island and ended up staying there for a long time. And I can, I, this kid came over to me, a guest pose in Rhode Island. And he said, Hey, man, you know, Mr. Mr. World's in New York next week. You want to compete? I'll drive you. You're in great shape. I said, oh, Okay. So I went, well, I went to Mr. World in New York, and that got me to London for the universe, which I came second. So there's another loss. Um, but yeah, you, you just, once again, being in the right place at the right time. I didn't guess posing in a while. I didn't know they had a show in New York. So, um, but I, I, I just think your life is planned for you. Because there's so many things when you read the book that just, just, just can't happen. It just doesn't happen, you know. Um, but you got to be doing your part too. Because if I had gone to the show out of shape or so so shape, there's no trip to London I don't to win. So I kind of always did my part. And yeah. for young people, you, you want to compete today. You know, you give everything you got. You know, you just and there's a sacrifice part because you're you're. It's a lot. You train twice a day. You have a full time job. A lot of people do. Um, you just got to figure it out. And don't let the naysayers bring you down. Use that for energy. That's the thank you. Thank you very much. I usually keep my mouth shut and just go train. I'll show them. All the thing I would say, I'll show them. I'll show them. And you definitely showed them. Yeah, but the workouts got really intense. I learned that from Robbie because he would walk through the gym door and don't speak to no one. Because, and I tell you why, because mentally driving to the gym of that morning, he had his mind set. He knew, you know what I mean? It's a mental approach. Same, and I learned that too. You, you, you go straight to the machine, straight to the dumbbells, whatever you need to do, go straight to it. This is business. This is work. I'm not here to play. You want to talk to me when I'm done? We'll talk. You can call me. <laughs> so one day I, I was training so hard with Robbie, I felt like I'm going to throw up. He looked at me and he goes, swallow it. He was sitting on the bench. He said, swallow it. So he was a man of few words, but from that point on, I never want to throw up again. I don't care if you pass out on the floor, who cares? But that's how tough it was training with these guys. So, and he goes, you want to drink some water? We'll drink when you're done. With his deep voice. And then I realized you don't drink water. Now, all my clients do have water. And they're training. I take care of my clients. But as a professional in those days at that level, you don't drink water. You don't talk. You just, and you don't take two or three minutes between sets. You might be lucky to get 30 seconds. If you get one minute. Because you have to build your intensity level to get that type of conditioning. You have to go to the next level and keep it up there for an hour and a half. And most guys in those days train twice a day. And I realized I couldn't get in shape training once a day. It just was not coming together. The size was not coming together. The conditioning was there. And when I started going twice a day, that's when, it, yeah. that's when the conditioning got there. And where do you mostly train your clients now? Do you have your own private facility or do you meet them at their place? Like, what is a training session with, with Tony Pearson like? It's a local gym here in Las Vegas, Anytime Fitness. And it's well equipped. And uh, that's where and most of my clients are older. You know, they say, hey, we want to train with you because we think you might have an idea at your age. So from basically from 40 and up, I got people in their seventies putting on muscle size. I just trained a guy, guy today, and I said, "Look at your arm. Look at your shoulders, man. Put a you know tighter shirt on. Show some muscles." And he said, "You remember when I first joined? I couldn't even do a hyperextension. I couldn't even do, I couldn't even bench the barbell." So all my clients are well proportioned, well balanced. Okay, what age they are, because if you have good form, technique, and know what you're doing, 
you can gain muscle and not training heavy. I got to protect them, protect their joints. So all my people, girls, ladies, and guys, they all look good because they're a reflection of me. They're not in shape. Oh, Tony Pearson, what does he know? No, they're going to be in shape. And and, and, and that take time with them because they're older, so you can't bring them to the gym and beat them up for weeks. We take, I call it baby steps. We'll get there. You got to crawl. We'll get there. And, and the year passed, and the year passed, and all of a sudden, yeah. They all look great. They all look great. And no injuries. So I love, I, love, I love training people because, you know, I can give back experience that I have and the knowledge that I have. And, you know, I see everything at the gym. I see every mistake, everything you do. I see it. I see it. I can feel it. I don't even see I can feel it. You get down to that last rep, I go, put it down. How did you know? I can see. So, yeah, I, I don't get a lot of young people. Though I understand that because when I was young, I didn't want to train with old folks either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the guys that goes in Venice and they were all like 10 years because Arnold 10 years, Rob is 10 years older than me and uh, Kent King was 20 years older than me. So I was the kid hanging around. But I think they liked me because I had the enthusiasm. I wanted to work. They knew I wanted to work. And I knew if I didn't do the work, you're out. But they don't have time to waste. Instinctively, I knew that. You never say no, as you read about George as well, back in St. Louis. You never say no. You just do what you're told. So, but I was enjoying it. It wasn't like, oh, God, oh, I got to go train. Yeah, I can't wait to get to the gym. I trained with this guy named Superman Blunt. Now, he's a good friend of Lee Haney's. I don't know if you know Superman Blunt. I don't know Superman, but I know who Lee is. Okay. So I trained with Superman Blunt in Atlanta for a couple of years. And, oh, man, we trained really, really hard, crazy hard. I think that's when I made a lot of improvement on my physique. Getting, getting out of L.A., moving to Atlanta, there's not much to do. We trained. And I, when I went back to L.A., I said, man, you grew. You gained some size. Yeah. Uh, this, and then uh, Superman started training with Lee Haney after I left. And uh, it was a great time for training. It was just I don't know, just intense, just intense. You gotta, you gotta really enjoy training. You know, you can't just do it because I want to get famous and make money. You gotta really enjoy it. It's gotta be a part of you. You know, I, I when I retired after twenty years, I retired ninety four. So for eighteen years, I didn't, I didn't go on stage. I didn't compete, but I never stopped training, and that's the trick. I didn't stop training. I did the squats, deads, everything. And I had a little bit of fat on me. And then after 18 years, I went back on stage. Got my body fat down to 3% there. I was posing again. It was so bad, I forgot how to pose. After 18 years, I forgot how to pose. Then I started practicing. I said, okay, it comes like riding a bike. It came back. So, but I, like I said, I never, since 1976 until now, I never stopped training. It's just a part of life. It's, it's some people train for a show, then they disappear for three, four months. No, oh, you're losing, you're losing the edge. So yeah, like I said, bodybuilding is a complete science, and my clients are understanding it now. I said, you're not just lifting weights. You're not a weightlifter. You're an artist. We're going to put the caps here. We're going to bring out the quads here. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then this is how the exercise we're going to do it. This is how we're going to use this exercise to do that. So every time you see me on stage, what you see is something I created. Hitting the muscle from a different angle, getting striations on top of striations, or filling out the muscle. Uh, you know, it's all by design. It wasn't just I'm guessing when I'm, I hope this works. No, I know it works. So my clients will prove to me that it does work to the point I start laughing. <laughs> God, we did it. <laughs> it's happening. It's actually happening. You know, it's weird, you know. You you think you know until you see that this guy hit a picture the other day he on his phone and he says, This is how I look in the beginning. I was oh my God. Because you forget how it looks. They forget. Right. So it was really night and day, really night and day. So we're on the right track. Be patient. But I wanted that. I said, No, you gotta be patient. Because you don't want to lose it. We train, you know. Gain muscle really fast, you lose it really fast. 
It's longevity. Just do the work. It might take you a year and a half, two years. So two years out of your life, that's not a long time. You know, not even 20 years. That's true. Was there, you know, we hear about body dysmorphia all the time and people not pleased, you know, once they hit a certain level at their peak. Was there a body part that you always wished either looked better or was a little bit bigger? Of course, my calves. <laughs> calves. They grew and then it was never big enough. They were never going to be big enough. But I said, I'll make up for it in the other areas. I have a crazy back. I get so cut. And my waist is going to get so small. I'm going to outpost everybody. That's the edge. So you might overlook the calves, but the back is wicked. <laughs> the, yeah, so, yeah. What is it about the calves that like so many people can't grow? It's a genetic thing. You know, high calves built for running, not for bodybuilding. So that's, yeah, a lot of African-Americans have high calves. We are built to run. Fastest man in the world. All, Usain Bolt, all these guys run us. Not built for bodybuilding. They want the full round calves all the way down. But if you get in such great shape to where you kind of overlook the calves, man, this guy's shredded to the bone. And he knows how to present it. And the back pole. You win from the back. You win from the back. And I did so many T-bar deadlifts, one-arm rows, seated rows, pull-ups. I made sure when I turn around, the back is going to be there. That's the edge. That's the edge. And it served you well. You know, it's funny because I see a lot of videos now on YouTube and everybody all of a sudden, I don't know if they're just following each other or it's just that time where they decide to talk about it. The side lateral, the lateral head on, on, the, on the shoulder and the rear dells seem to be the biggest point uh, of discussion right now. You know, what was that like? What was training that like back then versus all the discussion about it now? Because it seems that that wasn't a focal point of training in the in the sixties and seventies. You mean the rear delt? Yeah, like specific exercises. Like we have so many specific exercises where people want to do flies. Now they want to do them higher. Now they want to like do them from multiple angles. Yeah, that's a variation of the basic dumbbell laterals. You know, there's three heads. Coach, you want to develop that rear head, the rear head of the delt to make it round and full. Uh, it's just variation. It, there's more creativity, I think. I just stick to basic. A lot of cable laterals, dumbbell laterals, turning the wrist. Um, of course, front laterals, cables to the back, bent over laterals for the rear delt, or either see the machine. It, it, it's, it's whatever works best for you. Everybody's different. So you got to find your exercise. You just can't copy online. Oh, he's doing it. I'm going to do it. He looks good. You got to find what works for you. And, and and that takes time. With my clients, I got to find everybody's different. I got to find what works for this individual. And and that's how it, that's, that's how you take it. So if you see guys I'm doing stuff online, but is it going to work for you? I don't know. You don't know till you try. But once again, down to form again. It's technique and form, mind to muscle connection, knowing where you're placing it, mentally inside of that muscle. I'm, I'm deep into the muscle. I think the people that said, we didn't want to come near you watching you train because I was so in tune to my body. I was so into where I had to be in my head with the muscles. So, you know, squatting or dead, whatever I was doing, I was really deep in. And there was a wall. There's a wall. I watched Robbie Robinson train for two years. I was afraid to go near that man. From a distance, I watched him. Because he had that, don't even, <laughs> don't even think about it. <laughs> you know? I mean, Frank Zane, Arnold the same. You saw videos of Arnold training. It was real. It's intense. And and uh, Ed Corny. You saw Ed Corny pass out on the floor from squatting. Yeah. Who, who wants to talk? There's not no time to talk about what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Tony, with the documentary Driven coming out on October 6th, what is the one big takeaway you want from the audience 
to realize in your story that could help motivate them? Uh, number one is believe in yourself and know that you can achieve whatever you want. Yes, there's a sacrifice. Yes, you have to work hard. You got to you got to be a person who wants to work hard. You got to have that built in because it doesn't come easy. Nothing comes easy. So if you're willing to do the work uh, and also that to be in a survivor, because a lot of people go into a lot of things in their lives and, you, you know, you got to face it and move forward, you know, forgive yourself, forgive the abusers and just kind of move forward. Um don't let it get you down. I mean, don't turn to doing other things that you shouldn't be doing. Keep it healthy. Find a sport. Find something you really enjoy. Is it music? Is it running track? Is it dancing? Whatever it is, you know, get involved in that. I got into bodybuilding. Bodybuilding saved my life. I mean, what was I going to do after what I had gone through? I didn't go to college. What am I going to do? So I found a passion. That was my passion. So it's good. you got to find your passion. And let no one bring you down. Just people, negativity around you, get rid of them. Get rid of them. They're bringing you down because they don't want to see you go anywhere. So, and, and just believe. Uh, this, you know, the documentary is not just about weight training. It's about survival. The will to live. Um, being focused. And, you know, everybody has issues. You know, they pretend. And, and that was me, pretending. I did how many years of pretending. And then I decided to write the book. And it was very hard writing that book. There was tears certain days and joy other days. Because when you open up and unlock that, that, that door, and all the emotions come running out as you're writing it on paper or audio book talking out loud with these words it's 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 tough but it's freeing yourself if, if you're going to feel free in the end you're going to feel so much better i'm so glad i did it and that was, that was one of the greatest to find out what i had gone through in life that was a fear of mine i used to read articles about me in the magazine and i go this is so far from the truth but it's a beautiful article thank you <laughs> and i was living that you know People, oh, he's like great. He's this. He's that. And I go, wow, really? Robbie said one thing to me. He goes, "Don't believe your own press," and that stuck in my head too. Read all these beautiful. I had some really bad articles too. Trust me. But the good ones, you're like, wow, wow, this is nice. And then don't even think about it because you know where you are. You know where you've been. You know where you're trying to go. And it's a long way to get there. You're not there yet. I was never there. I was never good enough. I got in shape for shows because I said I'm not good enough. All I hear is criticism. I must not be good enough. So I'll train even harder. I'll show them. <laughs> Tony Pearson, it's been a great pleasure chatting with you today about your documentary, Driven the Tony Pearson Story, available on VOD October 6th from Generation Iron. Uh, if you are doing social media, where can we find you there? And where can we find your YouTube channel? Okay, Tony Pearson uh, on YouTube and Tony Pearson 87, Instagram, Facebook, Tony Pearson. I got three pages of Michael Jackson, Tony Pearson page. <laughs> so yeah, my YouTube channel, just, just Tony Pearson. Fantastic. Tony, thank you so much for your time today. Congratulations. From Survivor to Victor, it has been a great hope in watching your documentary for people that might have felt hopeless and for those of us that needed a little more inspiration today, especially in a world that keeps falling apart around us. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. It's been a blast. Thank you so much.